Hi everybody. Hello Gabby. Hi Auntie Mavis. Hannah. Taz. Hello Dylan. Just gonna wait for a couple people to join. Jaren, hey, Aaron. Bronwyn. Um, please, if you'd like to share the live, please do so. I'm pretty sure you have plenty of your um, friends at home that are probably preparing. Hi Sky, for the same exam for tomorrow. And just while I wait uh, for everyone to join in, um, yeah, that paper won. Uh, yes, the essay was uh, homeostasis. I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm scared to tell you what I think about the paper because the paper one because I'm scared that it's going to influence what some of you think if it thought it was an easy, easy paper. Um, it. Uh, thank you, Ch is it Changa Monkey? Thank you for the gifts. Um, I really appreciate any gifts that people send me because I'm just doing this for for everyone. Um, but anyway, paper two, uh, paper one, uh, my thoughts, my thoughts. Um, it was tough. Um, I thought that the paper was not easy. I know that it may come across as being easy, everyone. But I think that perception of that paper is is not what you think it was. Um, I thought the essay question was fine. If you answered them as separate paragraphs about carbon dioxide and temperature and vasoconstriction dilation. Um, Izzy, this will be uploaded to YouTube later today. Um, I'm going to do it before this evening. So once the live is done, I'll upload it. Um, and I thought it was an unusual paper. Um, I thought that they asked a lot of application questions and um, there was lots of like graphs and interpretation questions um, and I think that 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 male hormone contraceptive question was a nice question it's a good question it's just different and so I think a lot of you who did old papers weren't prepared for it yet and you weren't ready um, there were some tricky questions in there. There was one about um, nocturnal animals. Uh, do they have bigger eyes, more rods, more cones, or I can't remember what the last option was. And I hope everybody said more rods in their eyes, not more cones. They don't have more color vision and they don't have bigger eyes necessarily. But I'm scared that a lot of non-first English language speakers are not gonna get that. Um, so it does concern me. No, the paper wasn't too bad. It wasn't. It really wasn't a bad paper. It just wasn't what I expected. And let's assume tomorrow's paper is going to be the same because I don't think it's the original paper tomorrow. I don't think it's the original paper too. Um, I think it is the, the backup copy. Um, so what do I think the essay is going to be? Um, well, last year's essay was genetics, right? It was a question about paternity and blood group and stuff like that. So it's not going to be that either right? Um, so what is it going to be? Well, the topics that are big enough to house the essay is evolution and genetics. Genetics was done last year, so the likelihood of it happening again is very, very, very slim. Um, so I think it could be DNA. I see someone saying that now. It could be. They can do a crossover like they did in paper one. They did a crossover between human impact and homeostasis. Um, they could do a crossover. Uh, the crossover they've done before is something like explain um, genetic variation that arises in meiosis and describe how this would impact evolution. So that you talk about like genetics and variation and meiosis and then you talk about 
how that impacts evolution. And that's quite easy because all you talk about is crossing over, variation, mutations, how all those things happen. And then you talk about how um, that improves their favorable characteristics and unfavorable things. But I think you'll be okay. I think it's going to be an evolution question, a based evolution question of some kind. Um, so whether it's human evolution um, or if it's more like natural selection, I don't think they're going to go the natural selection route. I, I feel like they haven't done a human evolution essay in a very long time. So yeah. Um, out of Africa has been an essay as well. They normally group out of Africa and bipedalism together. Um, I've seen an essay. One of the hardest human essays I've ever seen was describe the key features of the Homo group and the Australopithecus group and how they have similarities and their differences in their skeletal um, structure and how that aids them in bipedalism and transition and like how you transition through that. That was an essay question maybe five, six years ago. So maybe it was in the 2014 or 2015 paper. That was a tough, tough question. And just so everybody knows, before I start the rest of this uh, live to do a little bit of explanation, I have put up um, about five videos this afternoon doing different questions from paper two. I've done an essay question. The essay question was gene mutations and evolution. I've done a dye hybrid uh, essay question. I've done a pedigree diagram question. I've done a DNA question. Um, so have a look there. Okay, so... Um, and my link uh, for the, my YouTube channel is in my bio and my name of my channel is just Miss Angler. Okay, so let's start off. I was thinking, let's do human evolution. Um, and we can do some genetics as well. I just see that somebody says wants to know the difference between continuous and discontinuous variations. Actually, pretty straightforward. I'll do that quickly. Um, yes, thank you. I'm having a great day. Um, so... The difference between continuous and discontinuous variation is very straightforward. Continuous means there is intermediates. In other words, there's perhaps we could use skin color, hair texture, eye color. It means that there's a variation and there's no then there's lots of little in-betweens. So in other words, if you were to take everyone in your class and the question was, put everyone from tallest to shortest, you have this continuous range and you can always slot people in. Discontinuous variation is when you either have it or you don't have it. So you either have um, A blood group or B blood group. I know that is tricky because you also get AB, but the point is, is that you either have it or you don't have it. Maybe something like, um, we think about earlobes, you either have a loose earlobe like mine or you have an attached earlobe which is where the earlobe goes down into the side of the face. That's discontinuous. So you either have it or you don't. And linked to that, everybody, I hope that you know your laws of Mendel because they will ask you to define it probably at least one of them tomorrow. And that is the law of dominance, the law of independent assortment, and the law of... Is it segregation? You do need to know those off by heart. Okay, so let me do some evolution stuff because I know that's what the majority of you want me to do. And I will make sure I can fit in a um, dye hybrid for you as well. Okay, so don't be stressed, Keeks. Don't be stressed. You've got this. Okay, it's not going to be too bad. So Human evolution, right? This is the question I get from everybody. How are they going to ask this, ma'am? What is it going to be like? So there's three ways they're going to ask this tomorrow. The first way they're probably going to ask it is they're going to use a phylogenetic tree. So a phylogenetic tree, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is those family trees that sort of start off from the base here and they split up into different components and they have like individuals all the way through okay uh, Mo don't worry this will be on YouTube the moment I'm done here it takes a little while to upload to YouTube but I promise I put it up straight away as soon as I can upload it okay so 
Um, Monique, the laws are Mendel's law of dominance, Mendel's law of segregation, and Mendel's law of independent assortment. There are three. Okay. So, Vashin, I will do that question for you soon. So let's just get back to this, and then I'll move on to something else. So the phylogenetic tree, you know, and that's where they put, like, they'll put, like, Homo uh, Neanderthal, they'll put Homo sapien, and essentially there'll be some kind of, like, timeline, and it'll be, like, six million years ago to zero million years ago, and they're going to ask you something like, how long ago did Homo sapiens arise? So what you do is you go to where the branch starts and you just measure it across with your ruler and you see where it intersects. Now, this is where it arose. In other words, where it came from, okay? But what happens if the question says, when did they become extinct? So when they become extinct is where these lines end, okay? So if this, for example, was um, a afarensis, Okay, Australopithecus afarensis, and they said, when did they go extinct? All we need to do is just use our ruler and look across here and see where it intersects, and you roughly estimate it along the timeline. So that's one way they're going to ask it. Another thing that's linked to this, everybody, is they are going to, and everybody here should know five differences and similarities between um, apes and humans. Everybody here should know five differences and five similarities for tomorrow. And remember, those similarities are in the skeleton. So, for example, if we did similarities, they would be things like apes and humans both have opposable thumbs. Apes and humans both have binocular vision. Differences, on the other hand, would be humans have an S-shaped spine, um, whereas apes have a C-shaped spine. Um, humans have a convergent big toe, or apes have a divergent. What that means is our, all our toes sit together like that, whereas in apes they have this space in between their big toe and the rest of their toes, and that's so that they can grab onto branches, Okay. Um, the frame and magnum, yes, that's a good one, Mo, and um, that's a difference. And so tomorrow you should know at least five of these. And the reason why you need to know that is they'll ask you to list this. They might ask you to make a table of differences or similarities. So, yeah, um, just to answer your question, Tamron, does the markers who mark our papers according to the memo, let's say my answer doesn't correspond with the memo. So what that means is if you write it in your own words, but it still makes the same sense of the memo, then yes, we can still give you the mark for that. Okay. Um, unfortunately, hair is not one that we need to know. Um, yes, the body and the pelvis, that's a good difference in similarity. And that brings me then to my second question they will probably ask. So if it's not in this format... It's going to be a skull or a pelvis question. And I think this is the one that everybody dreads, okay? But it's not scary. So the other option is a skull question. Now, they're not going to give you seven skulls and ask you, like a paleontologist, to put them from least to most um, evolved. They're not going to do that, everybody, okay? So let's say, for example, and you're going to have to deal with my lovely basic drawing of a human skull right now. But let's say they give you two skulls tomorrow. And these are our teeth. So just put that in there. Okay, there's our one skull. We're going to call this skull A. And then let's say this is the other skull. Um, okay, there's our eye and our nose, and that's skull. Are you all with me now? So let's say you get something like this tomorrow, and they don't tell you which one is which, okay? So now tomorrow you have to decide who is who. So... 
you have to say which is Homo sapien and which is the Australopithecine. So you're going to have to know stuff about the skull. And the key features we always look in skulls to tell the difference is things like the brow ridge. Okay. We need to know the teeth, in particular the canines. That's a clear uh, descriptor. We need to know the cranium, so how big it is or how small it is. We need to know, is there a prognathous jaw, which I'll explain if you don't know what that word is at the moment. Uh, brow bone, brow ridge, oh, um, sagittal crest. Some of you call that a cranial crest. It just means this crest that runs on the top here. Um, oh, of course, slope of face and chin or chinless. So there's a huge list of things that we look for. But um, if you just know the first, I would say four, you're good. Okay. Brow ridge, teeth, cranium, prognathous jaw. So first of all, we need to tell the difference between who is who. Um, and so this is our Homo sapien. And this, I know that my drawing is not super clear, but this is, I'm attempting to draw uh, Australopithecus africanus. Okay, it's, it's, Australopithecus is the most common one that they use. Okay, so there are my two species names. Now, you need to be able to tell the, tell the difference. So remember, we're going to look for specific things, okay? Look how large and round my cranium is compared to how much smaller it is in my uh, Australopithecus. Um, humans have a forehead, whereas you will notice apes don't have a forehead. Instead, what they have, which is very pronounced, is... A brow bone. We don't have a brow bone. We just go straight into the top of our eyes. Um, I want to talk about this word down here, the prognathous jaw. Humans do not have a prognathous jaw. Okay, our jaw is actually quite small. This is a prognathous jaw. Okay, and so when we define the difference, we say that they either have a prognathous jaw or we say non prognathous and I really hope that everyone gets that right tomorrow because um, if you don't use the correct wording and they're very specific about the wording in this section you use your terminology correctly okay so these are some of the things that you can use now you've been asking me um, are there how, how many other skulls can they give us they can also give you with like a third skull over here and maybe they'll put like a chimpanzee or they might even put another human. Um, but when I say another human, what I mean is another homo group. So I know you're all very worried. What happens if they give you a homo sapien? And let's say they gave us homo erectus. Okay, let's say that they gave it that as well. Remember that erectus is a transitional species, which means it's going to be somewhere um, in between this skull and this skull of Africanus. Africanus will be the oldest skull then erectus, then sapien. So that means that whatever the skull looks like is going to be somewhere in between. So is it going to have a big cranium? Yes, it will. But as big as a human? No. As small? No. So it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, then in terms of their face, well, they, have a, they do have a brow bone. Okay, they do f sort of bend into the forward into the forehead of the uh, of the homo erectus are they going to be as sloped no but they will have a slope to their face their jaw bone won't be as pronounced but it will definitely be there and its teeth will be big but not as big or should I say the canines will not be as big as they are in Africanus and so even though I know that these two maybe in my drawings look very similar remember that they will give you enough information grade 12s to know how to tell the difference okay all right now um one more thing they might ask you is the foramen magnum. So sometimes they draw the arrow in and they go, here is the foramen magnum. It inserts there, 
the foramen magnum inserts there and the foramen magnum inserts here. And they ask you which of the animals is bipedal. So which one of these is bipedal? A, B, or C? Okay, A, okay. A is the bipedal one. Why? Because of the foramen magnum. Now, I really want everyone to write this down if you don't already know this. If you look at the base of the skull, so now we're looking at the underside of the skull. Here is the foramen magnum in one animal. Here is the foramen magnum in humans. Okay? Foramen magnum. Remember, this is where the spinal cord goes into the head. When you describe this tomorrow and they ask you which one is bipedal, A or B, and I'm hoping everybody says B is the bipedal one, you are going to say that the foramen magnum is more forward in position. You are not, please everybody, going to write central, middle, tomorrow. They will not accept central or middle. And so my biggest concern is people are not going to use the correct terminology tomorrow, which will lead to you not getting full marks. Okay, so please make sure everyone that you are putting in the correct terminology. Okay, righty then. Let's uh, flip the camera around. So I just want to... Um, and what fossil site they were found in. Okay. All right. Uh, Keith, I will do transcription and translation for you. Oh, sorry. Am I covering the mic? Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? I will say it again. Can you hear me? Anybody? Can someone tell me if they can hear me? Okay, cool. Sorry, I, I was, I'm holding the phone now because I have to charge my phone. It's dying. I'll say it again. You need to know the fossil names. So Lucy, Mrs. Plays, uh, Ardy for Ardipithecus. Um, Ardy for Ardipithecus. Littlefoot. Okay, Lucy, Mrs. Plays. Oh, and Taong Child. Those are the five you need to know. You need to know who found them and where they were found, the fossil site. So the cradle of mankind, or was it the Great Rift Valley in Tanzania? That's what you need to do. Okay. All right. So somebody asked to go over transcription. I think it was Keek said, can we go over transcription and translation? I can do that. And then I will do some genetics with you. So I will clarify and do a dihybrid, monohybrid sort of thing for you guys. Okay. Uh, I just want to see if there are any other things that are going to come up for me. Cloning. I see you, Ashley, asking for cloning. Kiara, handyman. No, you don't need to know that. that. Well, you just need to know that Homo habilis was the handyman. That's all you need to know. That's an easy one to remember. Punnett squares. My essay prediction is it will be an evolution essay.
and it will probably be an essay on something like human human evolution in, in particular um, or how maybe genetics creates variation that leads to evolution like something like that but it'll be a basic evolution essay with some kind of variation okay everybody i'm going to do now um what did we ask for transcription and translation okay let's flip the camera around okay i'm going to do this at sort of a high speed so that i can get the most explanation in as possible with the least amount of time so i can do as much um yes kiara karabo you can know that it's an extra one you don't have to know who karabo is okay cool 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 so um translation and transcription so here we go transcription i to do this quickly now okay so we are inside the nucleus this is the nucleus over here inside the nucleus is our double helix of dna this is just a piece of the dna and so what happens in transcription is we want to copy the information right in other words transcription means we are copying Okay, so what we do is we take a section of DNA. Oh, there we go. I just need to unwind it. And we just unwind the section that we want. So we unzip, we unwind, and one side is used as a template. And by the way, you can find everything I'm writing here in nice bullet points in your exam guideline that you can get off the government website. Template. Okay. So here is our code. We've got A, T, T, G, G. And the corresponding side at this moment would be T, A, A, G, uh, C, C. Okay. Right. So that's the side that we want to copy. Okay. Now, how do we work this out? So let's say, for example, I'm going to make a copy of this side, okay? So what is the mRNA that's going to form for that? So it's really important, everybody in Matrix, I hope you pay attention now. Free RNA. I'm stressing that. Nucleotides. If you don't say RNA, nucleotides, you don't get the mark, Okay? That's it. You have to say RNA. If we're talking about DNA replication, you say DNA nucleotides. If you're wondering why you're not going to get full marks at the end of the year, or maybe in a remark, maybe you don't get those extra marks, it's these small little details right here. So free RNA nucleotides join um, their complementary bases. In other words, if I'm going to make my complementary side here, I'm just going to change my pen color. I'm going to make this side into my mRNA. So here is my mRNA strand that's going to form. So it's complementary to this. So it should be A now joins to U. T joins to A still. And now that's my little story about, well, A now has a new uh, little side little side chick. So now it's A instead of T. But T still thinks that A is the one and only. So unfortunately, T still goes with A, but now A has someone new, which is U. Okay? So it's U, A, A, C, C. Okay, this is my mRNA. Okay, now my mRNA strand is going to leave through the nuclear pore. Through the nuclear pore. And we now enter into the cytoplasm. And now we begin translation, which is effectively reading the copy. Okay? reading. So now we're going to enter into the cytoplasm and sitting in the cytoplasm is a ribosome. Now my piece of mRNA DNA, for, I mean excuse me, my mRNA at the top here, is written in sets of three everybody. Do you know what these are called? These sets of three letters.
Anybody? Codons. Thank you, Jamie. So this is a codon. We read mRNA, three letters at a time. Okay. So that now leaves through the nuclear pore and it's going to come into our ribosome. So I'm just going to redraw this inside the ribosome. Okay. So I'm just going to add one more letter on here so that we have at least three. So let's say we had G, C, C, A, A, and U. Now, before you ask me, I know my students have always asked me, ma'am, why do you write it this way? So why do you go U, A, A, C, C, G, and why aren't you writing it the other way? You will learn that in varsity if you do genetics, how to read genetic code. Um, the way we teach it in high school is not actually how you read genetic code um, in varsity, but that's besides the point. You just need to know that my mRNA has moved into the ribosome. Okay, so now we're in translation, which means we're reading. Now we read the code three letters at a time. Now a little delivery man appears and this delivery man has somewhat of a clover shape to it. And this is the TRNA. Attached to the TRNA are what three letters, everybody? What are these three letters going to be over here? It's going to be U, U, A. What do we call these three letters? Uh, Hiron, yes, the anticodon. So this is the anticodon. So the anticodon joins with the codon. Now, sitting on the back of the tRNA is what we call the amino acid. So these three letters on the codon match this amino acid. So these three codon letters match the amino acid. So the tRNA comes in. Where did it come from if you're going to ask me that? They float around in the cytoplasm. That's literally all they do. And so what happens is they act like a delivery man. They come in and they're delivering this amino acid. This amino acid is going to join a bond with another amino acid and then another amino acid. I'm just going to go AA here so that you see that these are all amino acids. Okay. And when I deliver this amino acid, this tRNA is going to leave. It's going to leave behind the amino acid. It's going to break off and it's going to go off into the cytoplasm. And one last thing, because eh, whoo, so many matrix get this wrong. Do you know what this bond is called in between here? Let's see who says it first. What is this bond that holds amino acids together? Here we go. Thank you. I think that was... Mo. Peptide. Thank you. There's only two bonds that you need to know. A peptide bond, which is for amino acids and proteins, and a hydrogen bond, which is what holds your um, nucleic information around. Okay, so quick flip around. I think what we're going to do now, because a lot of you asked for it, was a genetic cross, like a Punnett square. So we can quickly do that for you. Um, any other requests after I do the genetic cross? Um, Mikhail, a polypeptide is 50 or more amino acids. So you're not going to use the word polypeptide bond. There's no such thing. It's just a peptide bond. And then many peptides together make a polypeptide. Okay. Natural selection, I can do that as well. I know genetics is quite difficult with blood types. Ooh. Just want to see if there's anything else. Meiosis. Meiosis is a tough one, guys, to do because I don't know if I have enough time to do everything in meiosis. 
Okay, let's do the dye hybrid and the mono hybrid and natural selection. Uh, Roxanne, yes, this will go on YouTube. Like the minute we stop here, I'm going to upload it. It does take about 20 minutes to download just off of TikTok, but then I will upload it straight to my YouTube. Okay, so let me see if I can get this question in. Okay, sorry everybody, I think we lost connection for a few seconds, but uh, now we are back. So, I don't want to continue until we connected uh, properly again. So, monohybrids, I'm going to do this really quickly. Okay, so monohybrids, um, it's quite difficult for me to sort of explain these without using an example, but monohybrids come in complete dominance, they come in co-dominance, and they come in incomplete dominance. Okay, everybody should know the difference between these three. Um, complete dominance is you are either red or white, for example, if you were a flower. In co-dominance, you'll be red with, with white spots, let's say. And then incomplete dominance, you take a red, you plus a white, and it makes pink. Okay, so these are the three sort of outcomes uh, that you can get. You can get complete dominance, co-dominance, and incomplete dominance. And you use different lettering for this. Um, for complete dominance, I'm sure all of you are very familiar, you use like a capital R and a small r, you know. So that's the dominant, that's the recessive. For co-dominance, um, sometimes what we do for this to annotate it, I'm just going to write it down here. And they'll use like a, a big C, because it's co, just use the letter C, and they'll go R and little r. And then from incomplete dominance, we never use an I, okay, because I is for blood groups, but you should all know that. Um, they might do something like uh, R for red, W for white, and an RW is pink. And before you ask me, ma'am, can they ask all these different kinds of mono? Yes, they can ask any one of these monohybrids. Okay. Okay, so how does it look? So essentially, you always need to have your adult um, cross first. So you've got your P1 generation, right? And um, if it's sex-linked, you have to say male and female. So if it's, if it's a sex-linked disorder, you have to say male with or female without if it's not a sex linked disorder so it's a autonomic characteristic then you can just say like a black cat and a white cat you don't need to say a male white cat and a female white cat because auto uh um not autonomic sorry Autosomal, sorry, autosomal, I'm thinking of paper one. Autosomal is just all the other uh, autosomes, all your other chromosomes that are not sex. So if it's a sex-linked disorder, something like hemophilia, you need to say that it's a male with or a male without. Whereas if we're just doing colors, it'll be like a black cat, a white cat. And remember, that's when you just use this kind of lettering. Okay, the big letters and the small letters. Okay, cool. So you do your P1, whatever it is, and you multiply it. You then always write meiosis in the middle of the page. You go over to the side and you write gametes. And then you write in your gametes. Now, I like to put circles around my gametes. And yes, you're allowed to do that. Let's say, for example, I'm going to do my black and white cat. So... It was a black heterozygous cat with a white cat. Okay, so yes, you can put circles around it. Then we go fertilization. And we go F1, Punnett square. We copy our letters in, so big B, little b. Take these two. We can't separate the male and female from each other. Okay, and now we cross big B. Little b, big b, little b, 
little b, little b, and little b, little b. So now we need the geno and phenotype. So let's do the genotype. You can do the genotype in a, in a percentage or you can do it in a fraction. So let's do it in percentage. So 50% are big B, little b, 50% are two small b's, right? Phenotype. Okay, let's look up here. So this, um, I, I didn't write this at the very beginning, but I remember saying that we're going to do black and white. Let's assume that black is dominant and white is recessive. So that means if I have 50% big B, small B, I'm going to have 50% black cats, and two small Bs make white, so I've got a white cat. Don't be worried, they will actually give you all this information, like black, white, um, they'll give you enough information to work this out, okay? Um, now, just so that everybody knows, I uploaded a video this afternoon on a dihybrid question. They're never going to ask you to draw a whole question tomorrow. You're never going to draw the whole thing. Okay. In other words, you're never going to have to draw the whole 16 squares and then um, multiply into the table and then do. they'll never ask that. There's not enough time. Um because that would take you at least 20 minutes to do, and you don't have 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, right. Um, Sky, a hemophilia diagram. How to determine which child gets it from the parents? Ooh, this is a good one. Okay. I actually want to just flip the camera over so you can see this once more. Okay, I have, this is really important, okay? This is a trick question. Hemophilia. Okay, let's say... Okay, this is my cross for hemophilia. So it's capital H, small h, two small h's, and that okay so this is for hemophilia everybody should know this okay everybody knows that hemophilia is with the letter h okay this is the trick question how many male offspring have hemophilia in percentage how many male offspring have hemophilia in percent How many male offspring? No one's given me the right answer, by the way, and it's not 25% and it's not 30. Come on. Come, I know some of my students are watching, so I know I'm waiting for that right answer to come up. It's not 25. Mo, thank you. It is 50%. Okay, this is the trick question. I'm going to write it down so you can see. How many, or maybe they'll say percentage, how, or, or so the percentage of males has hemophilia, okay? So how many of the males has hemophilia, or um, what is the percentage of males have hem hemophilia? You are only talking about the males. These two are females. These two are males. So in total, how many males are here? Two. So of the two, who has hemophilia? Only one. Therefore, it is one out of two. In other words, 50% of the males. Okay, this is a trick one, everybody. Please, please, please. But this is the other way, okay? I'm going to save you tomorrow if this pops up. How many of the offspring have hemophilia? Okay. 
and you can say it in percentage if you want. I'll hold the phone a little bit closer. You can see how many in percentage of the offspring have hemophilia of all the offspring. So I'm just going to see if everyone gets it right. I think there was someone who just got it right at the very beginning. Let's see. What percentage of the offspring has hemophilia? The answer is... 50%. This female has hemophilia. This male has hemophilia. This male does not have hemophilia. This female does not have hemophilia. She carries an allele for it, but she does not experience any side effects. So how many of the offspring have hemophilia? 50%. Okay. Last trick question, everybody, on hemophilia. Females. Okay, this is what a female with hemophilia will look like. Now, technically, female hemophiliacs cannot be born. They will be miscarried. Okay, there is no such thing as a female hemophiliac. But remember something, everybody. What is a Punnett square? A Punnett square is a calculation of probability. This is probability that you are calculating. In other words, we haven't had these children yet. It is the probability of having these children. Okay? So technically, when... when the question says, how many of these female children have hemophilia? You will say 25% of the females or, um, yeah, you'll say 20, um, 25, you'll say 50% of the females because there's two females, just like there's two male options. So 50% of the females have hemophilia. Please do not get caught up in the fact that they're not born. We're not worried that they're not born. We just want to know what's the probability of having a female hemophiliac form. We don't want to know if she's born or not. Okay? Right. I'm going to give us another 10 more minutes before I sign off because I know a lot of you also have plenty of studying to go into the night. Um, Ashley, you want cloning? I will deliver. Here we go. Um... Quick sticks one. Um, I know all of you are wanting me to do long questions and stuff, but you can actually go see all of those long questions on my YouTube channel. Unfortunately, to, to do a whole question now would take too much time. So if you're interested, it is in my bio and you can go watch it on YouTube. And they're really short clips. They're like seven, ten minutes explanations. Okay, cloning. Here we go. So this is how it works. This is what we call reproductive cloning. Okay, here we go. So what we do is we take a somatic cell. Remember, that is a cell that has a full set of chromosomes, 2N. And then we take an ovum. And this is haploid. Okay, there they are. Now... What they do is, the somatic cell is from donor 1. The ovum is from donor 2. Okay? Inside the somatic cell, there will be a nucleus. Inside the ovum, there will be a nucleus. So this is what they do. They cut out the nucleus of the somatic cell. And this somatic nucleus will have 2N. In other words, it will have a full set of chromosomes. Okay, so they've cut that nucleus out. They will take the ovum and they will also remove the nucleus. So now what we have is an empty ovum. And we have a nucleus from a somatic donor. 
they will insert into the donor ovum. Okay, they'll put it in. And that will result in us having an ovum, which was from our first, uh, from our second donor, with a nucleus from the first donor. Okay, now they will then electric shock it to start mitosis because there's no fertilization taking place. So there's no like like kick to get this going. So they have to shock it. And then it divides and forms, you should all know this from paper one, a morula. The morula is inserted into either donor one, or donor three, a third animal. And so the reason why it's either donor one or donor three is because donor one gave us the original nucleus. So this nucleus will come out of there. Um, it could be in donor three. Donor three is because Sometimes they will grow an animal in a completely different surrogate mother. In other words, none of these females are going to carry their children. It'll be a third animal, a third maybe sheep or a third cow. And my question to the group is, if the nucleus comes out of this cell and the ovum is, has its nucleus removed and then replaced... Is donor one the clone or is donor two the clone? Who is the clone going to be of? Yes, it's donor one. Donor one is the animal we are cloning because we're taking the genetics and we're just putting it inside the ovum which essentially is what you do when you want to clone this animal. You just want it genetic. So you put inside an empty egg, and that empty egg will start to grow into whatever you want it to grow into. Okay, you guys are doing really well. I think that you should be confident for tomorrow. Um, is there anything else? I know that some of you wanted me to do natural selection. I actually have done this with someone already. But I will, do you want me to do speciation? How well do you need to know for evidence for evolution? Very well. You have to know all your lines of evidence. It's like the most important part of the whole thing. My essay prediction page is going to be an evolution essay. Human or like a general evolution, like how do you create evolution and um, perhaps evolution in modern times like antibiotic resistance or pesticide resistance, something like that. Speciation is like hitting. So, okay, so speciation, natural selection. Here we go. This will be the last thing we do today before I say goodbye to all of you. So I already writ this, wrote this up because I was explaining this to someone already. So let's just dive straight in to my little note here. I hope it makes sense because I'm not going to draw it live again for you. Okay. So. Um, here we go. So speciation is effectively when we make a new species, right? So let's say we have an island. And on this island we have some birds and these birds have a variation in their beaks some have long beaks some have short beaks but these are all the same species okay they interbreed with each other they uh, live with each other okay now let's say this piece of land broke into two something happened and now there's water in between, or maybe there is land, uh, like a canyon. There's something. There's a geographical barrier. 
And that geographical barrier is going to keep these two populations separate. Now, let's say, for example, the birds on the first island have a lot of flowers available to eat. They've got long, thin beaks. The birds on the other island, however, they have a lot of seeds available to them. So that makes sense in natural selection because all our long-beaked birds will have an easier time feeding in flowers because their long beaks can fit into the flower. Whereas our short-beaked birds, they have shorter beaks, which are better for cracking seeds. Now, natural selection comes in and it selects the favorable characteristics. So on this island, it's favorable to have a long beak. So we keep all the longs and all the short beaks die. And then on our other island, short is favorable, so all the long beaks end up dying. Now, it's important to point out at this point that these are not two different species yet. They are on the way to doing that. Right now, we're just choosing favorable characteristics. Okay? So, and by the way, everything that I sort of scr I've like scribbled down here, you can also get this beautifully written in the exam guideline word for word that you need to know for tomorrow. And it goes something like this. It says a population of a single species is separated by a geographical barrier. And it's important to emphasize the word population when you write it tomorrow, if you're going to have to write it, because it's referring to an entire population, not just um, a single species. Okay. Right. So we then split the population into two. And now there is no gene flow, which means that we can't fly across this space if these are birds. Okay, unfortunately, this geographical barrier is too big. So there's no gene flow. Each population is exposed to different environmental and selective pressures, like different foods, maybe different amount of mates, maybe the weather or the climate is different, maybe there's different predators. And so these selective pressures are different. Now, my example used flowers versus seeds, different food sources. Okay, natural selection occurs independently. In other words, whatever happens on the flower island is different to what happened in the seed island. Now, depending on the question, do you have to go into great detail in natural selection? Um, it depends. If the question says describe speciation with the mechanism of natural selection, then you go into lots of detail here. If you're just asking about speciation in general, this is the only sentence you need to include. Natural selection occurs independently. And for those of you sitting there thinking, um, well, what's the more explanatory version of natural selection? That's the whole, there are favorable characteristics, there are unfavorable. Those with the favorable survive, those with the unfavorable die. The ones that have the favorable characteristics survive and pass on their genes. And if you're wondering where I'm getting all of that from, yet again, it's from the guideline. It's written really well in the guideline. Okay, so now natural selection has happened independently. Two populations become very different. And if the two populations were to mix again, they will not be able to interbreed. Therefore, they are two different species. And perhaps when we mention interbreeding, they also don't create, I just want to add that in here, they don't create fertile offspring. Squeeze that in there. Whoops, there we go. Fertile offspring. Okay. Flip this around. Okay. It's a lot to, for me to fit into such a short space of time. Uh, do you, Kiara, you want to take a screenshot? You're more than welcome to. I'll turn the camera around quickly for you to see. Uh, let me just hold it away so that you can see the whole thing by the way you can find this explanation I've done here um, written very well in the um, oh, written very well in the exam guideline which you should all have okay is there any other quick questions that I can do for everybody that maybe I can answer for you um, before I go I just want to put you all down so I can see you. Okay, so if you didn't get a guideline, 
it's not too late to go onto the government website tonight and go and get the Life Sciences Exam Guideline 2017. You should be able to find it under their exam resources or if you just Google it, it should come up as a PDF. You will need it for tomorrow. You should have even had it for paper one. Punctuated equilibrium. Everyone's so nervous about this. Um, I've seen it in an essay as well before, but like it is a part of evolution, like I've said to you before. Um, punctuated equilibrium is when you have long periods of no change and then short bursts of rapid evolution followed by another um, long period of no change. So they use that form of evolution to describe um, holes in the fossil record and perhaps why we don't have certain um, fossils that exist, why we don't have transition fossils. It's actually very straightforward. If it was a part of the essay question, it's not going to be more than four marks, maybe. I'm not sure whether or not you are writing the backup paper tomorrow. I think... I think you are, um, because I think they've decided to write the backup paper for paper two tomorrow. Um, I see people saying that the exam guideline, uh, the government website is down, and I think the reason why the government website is down is because of this whole leaking paper business, which concerns me. Um, so, where are we going to find it? Hmm... If you just actually Google search life science exam guideline 2017, see if another website doesn't have it. Like, you know, like sometimes like another website will carry it like parent 24 or something like that. I'm, I'm very confident that you will be able to find it not on that website. Uh, modification by descent Eff effectively that is when you take a structure and you modify it for example um, the pentadactyl limb which is the hand so how it's modified that's a form of evidence that you should know I know someone asked me that earlier okay um, oh yeah um, there was no graph in the other question paper paper one you need to be prepared to draw a bar graph, a line graph, or a pie chart. So don't forget your protractor and your compass, please. Please. Okay. There was a pie chart in last year's exam, so prepare for the worst. Out of Africa hypothesis, yes, we need to know that. Essentially, you need to be able to describe where we started in Africa, where we moved to afterwards, and how we got there, and how important bipedalism was at the time. And, of course, the most important part of Out of Africa is we started as Homo sapiens in Africa, and then we moved out. In other words, we finished our evolution, major evolution, before we left. Then we left. We didn't slowly evolve into different groups of humans okay you're thinking of neanderthals which are not homo sapiens they had their own lineage okay i'll do the fossils one more time for you judy it is mrs plays lucy taong child um Ardi for ardipithecus they just called it Ardi. Um, and little foot. Um, someone keeps asking stem cell research. Um, so they can ask a stem cell question, but they'll build that into genetic engineering. And they normally give you like a case study. Um, so it's nothing too intimidating. Um, you don't need to know too much about stem cells other than the fact that stem cells can become any cell. Thank you, Kelly, for the rose. I think that's who gave it to me. Is it Quilly? 101? 
a genus and a genre. A uh, genre. Uh, so um, it just uh, a genus and a genre means one and and then many. So it's the same thing. It's just different words for the same thing. Thank you for whoever shared the guideline. I can't see who that was. It went by so quickly. And uh, now I can't find it. But if you can scroll back and see in some of the messages. Thank you, This Is Living. I'm so happy that I've helped so many of you do better, hopefully, in paper one. And that some of the things I covered today. Um, tips on mutations. I'll do that very quickly, okay? Very, very quickly. Um, so you get gene mutations. You get chromosome mutations. A gene mutation is when nucleides, nucleotides change. A chromosome is when the whole chromosome changes. In other words, you get an extra chromosome or you get one less. And the most tricky question that they will ask you is explain a gene mutation, what it is, and then how will that affect protein synthesis? And this is what you'll say. And I actually made a video on my YouTube today, so maybe you should go and watch it. So I won't give too much away, but you can go and see it there. Effectively, a gene mutation is when there's a change in the nucleotide sequence that's found in the DNA. And that will affect the type, or should I say, the order of the mRNA, which will affect the tRNA. The tRNA will bring a different amino acid. And if um, too many different amino acids appear, then a different protein will form. However, we know that some codons all code for the same um, amino acid. In other words, the same lettering for the same... Um, coding so like for example uh, threonine or alanine um, a lot of them have different letters but they code for the same thing um, so it doesn't always lead to a different protein but if you want the, I've done a really nice video on my YouTube explaining mutations and evolution in an essay the link is in my bio for my YouTube channel I think it is a new paper. You keep asking if it's going to be the, a new paper. I, th I think it is the new paper. You can always tell everybody because you, the cover is different. It's not the same. I wish I had a different, I wish I had a past paper with me to show you, but the paper is different because they don't have a lot of time to print it. So the front cover is not the same as old papers are. So you can always tell. And at the very top, if you look where it says like, um, NSC DBE 2020 at the top, okay, it will actually have the words SC, which means supplementary or second paper, so that's how you also know, it'll be right at the top in the middle of the page, it'll say SC, which means supplementary or secondary paper. Um, just to let you know, someone asked a question there. They do set the papers a year in advance. And they set more than one. So they set two papers, so just in case. Um, and these papers were already set in 2019. Okay, they weren't set now. Um, and so, in other words, 2021's paper was already set this year in June, July time already. And next year, those metrics are really lucky because they don't have any essays. Essays no more. Okay. All right. Um, I think that I'm going to leave it there. It's been quite a long um, live. Um, as we finish right now, I'm going to download this immediately to my YouTube. And I'll try and do my best to put the timestamps of the different topics so you can fast forward to those and have a look. Um, thank you again for anyone who sent me a gift. I really appreciate it. It's not necessary, but it is... I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will be having a couple of other lives, maybe to talk about a couple of other things. Maybe we can do a little memo discussion on what you think paper two's answers were. So I know that some of you know how well you did or maybe didn't do so, you know. Um, but yeah, don't forget to check out my YouTube channel. Maybe some last minute things there in my YouTube channel that you'll be able to pick up. And I will see everybody later. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Every have a good <laughs> exam tomorrow everybody and make sure to get some rest
Okay, everybody. Bye.